Hello and welcome to the UDME Autism Awareness and Suicide Prevention Course. My name is David Adrian Thomas. I am an Esquire of the Royal Division of the of the United Kingdom and I run the County Surveyor Society International Limited. Uh, it is a non-profit organisation dedicated to helping people with Asperger's Syndrome cope with the everyday problems of life that they suffer with. Um, date back to uh, Christmas Day 1066 uh, and was set up by William the Conqueror and his squires of the Shires um, to help him govern the country whilst he was back home in Normandy governing uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that dukedom. <clears throat> children who have it uh, are 28 times as likely as other children um, to contemplate or attempt suicide. Adults who have it are about 9 times as likely as other adults um, to contemplate or attempt suicide. I have it and I have and I attempted suicide five times in my childhood and once in my adulthood. Um, it is a genetic, lifelong, incurable condition uh, but I learned to uh, manage or control and stop uh, the suicide ideation uh, I suffered. Uh, when I was 15 years of age. Um, this was because uh, of the County Surveyor Society traditional pedagogy called uh, Sitting with Nelly. Uh, Nelly was normally the, the eldest surviving uh, female relative of a, of a child um, who would teach them the ropes of how to cope with uh, their life or with this problem and uh, but my my uh, uh, my nearly was in fact my mother's maternal grandfather who had lost his wife uh, 30 years previously um, he was deaf dumb autistic feral and shamanic quite a character right my first attempt was my first attempt to uh, develop uh, this system of control uh, was at the age of 15, uh, as I said, uh, and it lasted until I was nearly 50. Uh, it, it stopped because uh, it had relied on self-hypnosis and, uh, and I'm afraid the uh, uh, the, the hypnosis uh, was uh, um, destroyed by hypnoregression therapy that I had to have uh, for a nervous breakdown uh, at the age of 49. Um, my second attempt then came after the therapy I received uh, um, from the psychiatrist uh, and he asked me to um, counsel my colleagues uh, with it. Uh, and I started counselling on the office intranet in those days. Uh, and then when they all retired, which was by 1997, the internet was back, was in operation. And they asked me to continue coaching and counselling them on the internet. And I continued that until I in fact retired at, um, at the age of 65. On, on my retirement, I began updating my skills and knowledge um, uh, because I wanted to write uh, autobiogra uh, autobiography about my life and works, uh, uh, which is what I did. And my initial trilogy and compendium rocketed to the top of the Amazon bestseller list overnight. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, I was asked uh, to become a blogger on the Huffington Post, 
And the result of that was that my Facebook page began to swell with people who were interested in what I have to say. I had developed a recommended program, uh, which is in seven steps. The first step deals with um, quelling, churning thoughts of suicide. Uh, the second step then looks at the uh, passive and uh, active incomes of the incumbent because the greatest worry that I discovered in my research um, is the ability to um, feed, clothe and house yourself uh, and if you don't have those bare necessities you can hardly concentrate on things like getting decent qualifications and a good job and meeting a partner and maybe starting a family and that to be honest is roughly all any of the people that I've ever coached in council ever wanted uh, nothing more right? uh, but I like to be happy as well so the next so step uh, so step three looks at uh, happiness and, uh, and how to raise your happiness quotient uh, Step four then looks at coincidences. Okay, it's a uh, opportunities arise through coincidences, and so uh, oh, the object of that particular uh, section will be to uh, uh, to increase uh, conscious awareness of uh, of uh, those kinds of coincidences that uh, opportunities can come from. Right then, I uh, the step uh, step five then looks at miracles. Now, uh, not many people think that miracles are possible, but they are, and you can induce them. People talk about the law of attraction. I don't talk about the law of attraction. That's what um, it's a lot of waffle as far as I'm concerned. But the thing is, it does seem to work. Some people seem to attract miracles, and others seem not to. Okay, the, uh, then, then section six looks at what's the little gatekeeper. Now, inside your head, there is a uh, there are layers of uh, consciousness. There's uh, there's your awake consciousness, and there's your subconsciousness, and then there's an unconsciousness. And the unconsciousness is the part that does about eighty-five percent to ninety percent of the work of your brain, but it has a gatekeeper. Right, it protects everything that's in there very carefully. So that it can't be changed because uh, <clears throat> it's like a kind of theory of everything uh, on which to uh, base your uh, method of coping with day-to-day -day problems in life. So sometimes you need to get past that get people, gatekeeper because uh, when you're up before you're about six years of old, six to seven years of age, you absorb anything anybody tells you, and you accept it as being gospel truth. All right, so. Some of it isn't. People call it fat and ugly. How many people, you know, continue to go through their life thinking they're fat and ugly when they are not fat and ugly? But only because these, somebody had said it when they were very, very little. And the reason for that is that up until six or seven, your brain is in a kind of a semi hypnosis trance. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's very highly suggestible. Right? And, then, and then finally, we will be looking at. We will be looking at the saint and hero in you. We will be looking to find ways of doing extraordinary things, epic things with your life. Okay, then step one, uh, as I said, um, looks at the churning thoughts. Right, and to help you with this, um, I, I really need to give you more of my backstory. Uh, my earliest living memory, my, my earliest memory, let's put it that way, as discovered through the hypnoregression therapy, because I had suffered 35 years of amnesia, okay, which is why I needed hypnoregression therapy, I should add, right? That tapped into very, very strange memories, very bizarre memories. Uh, then the first one of these was that I had died in the womb. Grim Reaper had taken me back to heaven for God to have and to hold and to walk and talk and play with and comfort me. And then when the maternity team reoxygenated my body here, back here, back in, back in, on earth, right, God gave 
Grim Reaper me back here and uh, Grim Reaper returned me to Earth for me to kickstart my body back to life. Okay, now, <laughs> that's bizarre, okay? But it gets even more bizarre. The second earliest, uh, on my way home from hospital, uh, in a car driven by my father, he turned the corner, the passenger door opened on my mother's side, and the centrifugal acceleration of the vehicle turned the bend and flung me out onto the road. <coughs> and I hit my head on the road and on the curb and on the focal wall beside the road. And so, yeah, and then my mother had to resuscitate me there, okay? But it was the same Grim Reaper and the same God who attended to me between the death and my life again, okay? in between the death and life. Uh, then my third earliest memory was dying of a cot death the following early hours of morning. Then Grim Reaper take me back up to heaven. Okay, but this time he brought my mother's grandfather, maternal grandfather, with us as well, right? And we were met in heaven by all our ancestors, a huge congregation of people. Grim people went back and got my mum and dad. And when they got there, okay, they christened me, David Adrian Thomas, and dedicated me to God's service for the rest of my life. For saving me so many times. All right, now nine individuals, sorry, ten individuals stepped forward. Nine of them were ancestors, and the other was Grim Reaper. The ancestors were God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, in honor of my mother and father, because they were their they were favorite divine trinity. Uh, then Gaia. Zeus and Hermes, uh, in honor of my mother's maternal grandfather, because they were his favorite, uh, his favorite uh, trinity. <coughs> and then uh, King David, the boy king of Israel, he stepped forward, and then uh, and also then uh, Emperor Hadrian of Rome, and then also uh, Saint Thomas of Didymus uh, from the Bible, as being is representing my uh, favorite trilogy in him. So uh, they swore that they would be my secret invisible friends on earth for the rest of my life. Uh, and they would protect me and they would assert me and they would counsel me uh, to help me on my way and, and to undertake my mission because this is an important element uh, that I found at the back of everything that was going on in my head. Now, of course, Grim Reaper then brought uh, uh, me and my mother's maternal grandfather and my mum and dad back to earth uh, and put us back in our bodies to keep starting back to life. And uh, then my next earliest memory was of the afternoon on that same day when Grim Reaper took me and my mother's maternal grandfather back to him again. And we were there from one o'clock in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night, uh, having tutorials from my various members of uh, of uh, my ancestors, particularly the nine that I just mentioned to you. Now, <laughs> that became a habit. Every day then, six days a week, we would do that. And we would call on them by, we would go, at one o'clock, we would call on them and we would come and fetch us by dying. Literally by killing ourselves. I won't tell you how we do it, we don't want you repeating it. <laughs> okay, so. And we were off the heaven we would go and uh, 
he wanted to go up. He was he came along for the right basically because he wanted to be with his wife and his mum and dad. And he sat there with them all day chatting about stuff. He had to say they, they were they, he was very lonely on earth. And so that, as I say, became a habit and that went on for three and a half years. Now then, the reason it stopped was uh, My mother enrolled me at County Nursery School. But she didn't tell us until the day before I was supposed to start attending. No. This meant to us a complete disruption of this, uh, of a routine that we got so used to day in, day out for three and a half years. Right? And we asked these are not conducive to it people interfering with our routines. So we'd rather, we decided we'd rather die than live at all. Okay? Not live like that. So we went down into town and we jumped off a high bridge into the river which was in flood at the particular season to drown ourselves. I survived. My mother's maternal grandfather died a year later of complications uh, from from breathing and drinking the water, which was very heavily polluted because it was it was flood water of summer streams that come down from the from the mountains and has to come through down through industrial land and uh, very highly developed land on the way. So it's picking up a lot of pollution and ground pollution and uh, and, uh, and, and, and human waste and so on and so forth. So, I was barred from seeing him at all that year. So, I had to learn to travel solo with Grim Reaper to him. So, that's what I did every day. I, in fact, was locked in a library all day here. And my miss had taken me to work with her. And where she, where she worked was, uh, was the, uh, the mission school where. They had evening classes for learning how to become missionaries, okay, and so there was a mission library, okay, so they used to lock me in the lobby all day until the evening classes that evening, yeah, and I would then sit in on the evening classes, okay, so that entire time, entire day, apart from <laughs> the time in the afternoon, one o'clock, bang, on the, on, the, on the stroke of one, get Grim Reaper to come and fetch me and I would be there then until about half past five or to the six because the mission school started at six o'clock right so that was my life then for, for the following year for the following year yes six days a week on the seventh day I attended church with my parents obviously they were very religious people but this uh, this six to one uh, balance of my timings and my waking hours being spent with with with, uh, uh, with my great grandfather on one side and them the other meant <coughs> I didn't bond with them. I bonded with my mother's great grandfather. So when I lost him, that I did practically devastated me anyway. When he died, we had to vacate his cottage. And uh, we went, uh, we had to move, uh, we moved to a village about three and a half miles away. And I started going to County Nursery School there. But the fact that I was well used to be locked in the library, uh, uh, virtually all my time for homeschooling and for study and so on and so forth meant that the head teacher locked me in a store every day, all day, so as I wouldn't, so that my meltdowns wouldn't disrupt the kids, uh, now the other kids. Well, if I melted down uh, on the first two days, um, in normal class, and of course caused such disruption when I just collapsed on the floor in a heap there. Teachers came rushing to my aid. Felt my pulse, nothing. I 
listen to my breathing, nothing, okay? And uh, they rang for an ambulance, the ambulance came along, and the ambulance people, the attendants, they actually said, oh, he's gone, he's dead, he's taking with us. And they bagged me up and they put me on the gurney and, uh, and they were trolleying me up to the ambulance when I sat up in the body bag and caused absolute mayhem in the school with the kids all screaming and everything. So that happened two days running. After that, their teacher said, enough is enough, you're going in the storeroom, boy. So I went in the storeroom and uh, that's, where I, that's where I spent every day, all day. For that one year when I was at Coventry University School and the two years following when I was at Coventry University School, although I was on a different campus. And uh, I took with me uh, a set of encyclopedias that, had, that, that were the hard copy versions of, of uh, loose leaf uh, encyclopedias that my mother's maternal grandfather had taught me to read and write from, right, to university entrance exam level in that three and a half years. He's an amazing man. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry I'm drifting a bit around. Um, now then, when I went to junior school, the head teacher said that what I had was witchcraft. It was witchcraft that was, uh, what was affecting me. And he told the rest of the school, when well, the Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, so they try to kill me four times a day, every day for the first uh, five days of that term. So on the Friday night after school, I ran away from home and tried to kill myself. Uh, four times in fact. And Grim Reaper obstructed me the first three times, but taking me up to heaven and bringing me straight back and dumping me straight back in my way. <clears throat> and then on the fourth occasion I demanded to see God. And I was there for 48 hours. My body was in a coma. Oh, my body was still. In fact, it was frozen because it was in a industrial um, uh, coastal is where I went to die back on that particular occasion. And my body was as stiff as a board. Uh, right when uh, I was declared dead again uh, by the doctor, a doctor who lived opposite us, and, uh, and my mother was actually washing my body down, stripping my body down, <clears throat> uh, for the undertaker who was there in the room uh, uh, was she was doing it, and he was going to screw me into a coffin and take me away for autopsy. And I sat up while she was doing this. Uh, of caused another bit of a fuss there. But she was glad to see me. Anyway, she was glad to see me. Anyway, uh, the whole point here is that these are my memories. This is what was in my memories when the hypnoregression therapy was undertaken. These are the things that were discovered by the psychiatrist. He was looking for some kind of sexual abuse that of course made lose my memory. But there had been none, and uh, or some kind of, tra kind of trauma. He did discover the trauma at the age of uh, at the age of fifteen. I had a severe head injury, and uh, 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 the point is this: you see, is that he said to me that these events don't actually have to be real. He said. Your brain doesn't know the difference between real and imaginary. Uh, your brain only knows uh, that, it, that they're real inside. They said they exist in your head. And so uh, your regression therapy has actually informed me of them. So he said, uh, but of course he said, there could be feelings. He said, because people with Asperger's syndrome, they are hypersensitive feelings, hypersensitive to sounds, smells, sight, uh, touch. And uh, hot and cold, and uh, but also to internal feelings such as emotions, such as anger, panic, depression. Okay, and they can be uh, 20, to, 20 to 30 times as sensitive as other people. So it could very well be that those memories are 
memories of feelings, interpretations of feelings rather than interpretation of events. Okay, so uh, so that's you accepted that. Now the thing is, I rather like the Deepak Chopra quote about about this kind of thing he talks about. Uh, a mythological being inside you. And this I think is the is this kind of this 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 backstory stuff right now. It goes beyond that because another important element of my childhood was my secret invisible friends because they literally were my constant companions on earth. They were there all the time. And I in fact got them to help me cure my uh, suicide ideations at the age of 15. Okay, yeah, I, I asked them to, to shape shift into a, the shape of the hand and come down and put the hand on my head and tell my journey short, my journey thoughts to be still. And they did it and it was immediate. And they just, the journey thoughts stopped overnight. Okay, they stopped forever. However, I had told God that, that I was going to clear the bank, clear my mind that night. Right? I never wanted to think about those things again. So I was going to clear my mind that night. And so I did. Okay, and I was, next morning, I didn't know who I was, where I was, what I was, why I was, or oh, how and when I got to be like that. So, yeah, I was a, I turned into a workaholic zombie. I could literally an autopilot. And I was like that for the next 35 years of my life. <laughs> uh, anyway. Chopra also talks, you see, about the mythical beings. And this is a this is something that was very important. I mentioned to you earlier that it has to do with a lot has to do with what happened, what happened when people told you things when you were before you were six years of age and you were very highly suggested when you therefore accepted them and they became by belief system. Now, what Chopra says is this, is about these are, some of these are mythical beings. Well, I've told you already, mine, three of mine were mythical, four of mine were mythical beings, if you like. Or if you want, six of them were mythical beings, all right? So, but you see, you see the point here is that it's the myth that's going on inside you that has an awful lot to do with who you believe you are, what you believe you're here for, what your purpose is, and so on. Okay, and uh, that's the point he tries to make in this. So, this this lecture now is number one lecture of lectures of of uh, seven lectures. Okay, and each lecture deals with one of the steps of the program, and this particular step is quelling the journey thoughts and my advice you has been right to get some security invisible friends to do what I did, and that is to tell them I uh, right shape shift into a single hand and lower it uh, onto my head and tell and direct my journey thoughts to be so. Now, yeah. Chopra is very helpful in the way he describes it, how you can develop your own set of secret invisible friends. Now, there's nothing unusual about having secret invisible friends. Every child that develops uh, secret invisible friends to walk and talk and play with when they're alone. Okay, and it's okay even for adults to have them. Um, the, the the one time richest American in the world, um, Andrew Carnegie, was very proud of his, he called him his management team. And his protege, Napoleon Hill, actually lectured about him um, in the course of selling the book, his book, which is a thing with the rich. Now, okay. Uh, uh, that book, in fact, is read by, is taught by virtually every life and business coach in the world nowadays. And so, 
you've got millions of people. Right. They're finding out the way and we've got a year and a mastermind. So they're imitating them by developing their own. So, as I say, there's nothing unusual about, about them. And uh, the, uh, the other issue, if you start looking at what happened back there, right? Back there, no, right? I travelled to him. I was, I was in heaven almost as often as I was on earth, if you see what I mean, right? So, and I would go, and I would travel there, and I would come back. And it was uneventful. The only event was me dying and coming back to life. They were the only events, and I developed no fear whatsoever of dying, or of coming back to life, or of the afterlife. Right, because I knew I'd been there so many times, right? It was common to me, it was common, right? It was as natural to me as being here on earth. Okay, that is what was inside my body. And this is why, in my view, this is why I suicide ideated and attempted to kill myself. Because I don't fear going on the other side. In fact, I don't fear of staying here. Than actually dying one him. Right, so that's probably why I was doing it. Anyway, the other issue that I want to pick on is this. These secret invisible friends that I had, they come from my very, very small mind, young childhood. And if you remember what Jesus said, suffer little children to come to me, but of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what we're talking about here is my little kingdom of heaven way back then when I was between the ages of one and three and a half initially and then up to seven and a half later, that was my little kingdom of heaven. Uh, even just being locked in store or being locked in a library, that was my kingdom of heaven. I was, it was idyllic, it was the happiest time of my entire life. So anyway, the idea that I had about getting my secret invisible friends to shapeshift. And because they can do this, right, they may be 60, 70, 80 years of age now, in my image, because they grow with me, okay, I can make them shift shape back into being children again. Like that. So they shape shape back into children again, and then they're forming a hand, and, they, and, and I call that the hand of God, because God is amongst them. And I have an understanding that, uh, you know, made the God stuff, like the whole uh, universe is made of God stuff, so every single one of us is made of God stuff. Uh, so every single one of those ancestors is made of God stuff. And more than that, right, because uh, the mythological people are in the Akasha field, they where, where they uh, represent the memories of gazillions of people uh, who left these little traces of memory, right? In the ether, okay, that is the what people call the library, the Akasha library or the Akasha record, and you can and I can tap into that, and so uh, what I'm getting was even the myths, right? Because the ether is composed of a dark energy. Okay, that dark energy came from the Big Bang. All right, so if you think in terms of what was before the Big Bang? And the answer is God, okay. Well, what did God use to, uh, to create the universe? He created himself. So what he did, he exploded himself, put him away in the Big Bang. And so we're all little, we're all tiny particles of God. Everything is tiny, every single bit of creation is tiny particles of God. Even these bits in the Akasha field, even these little memories in the Akasha field, because they're all creations of people that are being and traveling through time and space on this planet Earth. So, if you think of it in those terms, then you'll see that where I'm coming from, I'm actually talking about a lot of quantum entanglement between the particles. Now, there's this connectivity going on all the time between the particles that are entangled. And one happens to one, happens to the other. So if this one's happy, that one's happy. If that one's sad, that one's sad. If that one's depressed, that one's depressed. 
Right, so you want this duplicity all the way through. This is, and this is why you can't escape from these terrible journey thoughts, because even if you can lose that part of you, you don't lose that other part of you. And that other part of you may not be inside your body, it may be in the aura around you. So that's why it's so difficult to get rid of these journey thoughts. And this is why it's essential you get these your super invisible friends to okay, to actually do the journey with you, just make them make them shut up. Now when you've done that, I recommend you do this every night before going to sleep for 14 days. Okay? And you can leave the rest to brain and neuroplasticity because what neuroplasticity does is uh, it prunes away neurosynaptic pathways in your brain that get little use. Alright? So it's going to start pruning away these pathways that carry the journey thoughts. And you suppress them. Alright? Then it's just going to stop doing so. So the neuroplasticity will start pruning those away. And what does it do with the prunings? It uses those to reinforce thought pathways to get greater use. Now, the very fact you are being reduced, your, your mind is having the being distracted from the journey falls to suicide. It means that you begin to feel a little bit more inclined to think about the other problems in your life, like, as I mentioned, money, like, as I mentioned, the happiness, like, as I mentioned, the spirituality, like, as I mentioned, the opportunities, like, as I mentioned, miracles, and so on and so forth. Now, this will completely change the package inside your head, the wiring, as a lot of people call it, right? And so your wiring changes, so it's not carrying too many thoughts anymore, it's carrying more normal thoughts. All right? Normal thoughts. Don't worry, right? but everybody bloody gets, you know, no, no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no rule about who worries about money, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> neuroplasticity now does this work in the first 14 days. Then you start doing step two, which is getting your money sorted up, okay, and within another 14 days to sort it out. Right, that will come in the next part of uh, the, the uh, in the next part of the, uh, uh, the course. Now we look at, right, so basically I've come to the end of this lecture because I told you what step one is, what to do. Okay, now, do uh, you want any more information on this, uh, right, I included this little, uh, uh, this, uh, this slide here, which includes, which is a bibliography basically. First of all, so you know that in the Genoa article, okay, Company Severe Society, International Legi uh, Limited, its registration number, I'll give you that um, in our notes, uh, right? So that you understand what we're talking about. We're talking about Asperger's Syndrome, okay? And the Company Severe Society and a lot of other stuff you'll find in Wikipedia. I'll give you the, I'll give you the Earl for the Wikipedia, yeah, Wikipedia uh, webpage article on Company Severe Society, it's you see that it, it does go back a long way, and it uh, was a legitimate uh, uh, up until a uh, legitimate organization until about 1997 ish. Okay, then, right, so that you know that uh, what I'm telling you about the propensity of uh, children to suicide ideate, I've got the Penn Research, research uh, uh, report. Okay, so I, I give you the Earl of that, you can uh, uh, read that. Similarly, the adults uh, being light and likely, that's from Cambridge University, so uh, yeah, I, I give you that in the notes as well to, to go look at. Um, now, you'll find the story of my entire life and works in my, my books, uh, which are a trilogy and compendium. My advice is get the companion, companion because you can get that's, uh, that's three books and two for the price of one. Uh, no, sorry, 
Surya Talalaya. <laughs> it's three books for the price of two books in one book. <laughs> okay, there you go. So that, those are my books. I'll give you the Earl where you can get hold of those. I also give the Earl of my archive on the Huffington Post so you can see the kind of range that I'm talking about to the people of America basically because uh, all of my work goes on to the New York edition, the, uh, the USA edition of the Huffington Post. Because the concern, because well, the, uh, this, this effort that I'm putting in now is autism awareness and suicide prevention rules, right, stems from a comment that was made to me. I think it was on my, in my, uh, either on my first or my second blog. I was challenged to come up with a holistic solution to the suicide problem of autistics, the autistic suicide in, in America. Okay, so, and this is the response. Because the thing is, of course, what well, the point I'm trying to make is this. Companies of Air Society were operating in this country in 1997. So we were getting this pedagogy said to us, okay, that pedagogy was being fed into America until independence. On independence, we did away with companies of Air's as they were then because countries of Wales and Mosley were appointed by the king. Now, you thought that was uh, uh, nepotism, you thought it was privilege. So you said, stuff this, we want to vote, we want to elect our countries of Wales in future, so that's what, he, what they did. So the countries of Wales Society didn't start in America, despite the fact, of course, that your first president and third president of the both were countries of Wales and both have been trained in this, uh, in this particular field. They know all they know all about it. And so, my archive will uh, refer to the one. And the other thing is that um, <clears throat> you'll find a lot more explanation about this on my Facebook page, uh, which is the Congress of Air Society page book, uh, Facebook page, uh, because as I say, have attracted quite a large number of the readers, uh, and they are they and they are attracted to me because of this business about autistic suicides in America. Well, right, a lot of them uh, are, are Americans and and, are, and have contacted me and have come out on my Facebook page. And the thing is, um, uh, so I've got those. And I've also got a, a LinkedIn page. I'll include I'll include that as well for you. Um, and that's it then, that's the end of this particular lecture. I'll see what uh, at the uh, next time, lecture number two, uh, where I will be uh, looking at the uh, the money problem that I was referring to earlier. I should add that, uh, right, that the, uh, the lectures two, three, four, five, six and seven will be much shorter than this one. You'll be pleased to know. So bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.